again, everybody. I want to talk to you now about what I'm calling the English 1020 practice run. And so, as I mentioned in my other video, um, the English 1020 final exam is administered cold. So you will not know until you actually take it what the text is going to be or what the prompt question is going to be. However, I can show you a past 1020 exam and you can sort of take a practice run on your own um, and, and just sort of see how you do so that you have some feel for what this is going to be like. And I strongly encourage you to do that. So if you wanna follow along with me and I suggest that you do, go to content and go to English, to, or I'm sorry, go to final exam materials and then go to English 1020 practice run. So this is an actual past English 1020 final exam. And you see that it says, read the short story and respond to the prompt below. So in a well-developed paragraph, discuss two of Mademoiselle, and I do not speak French, so pardon me, uh, Arlie's character traits. So the general instructions and reminders, uh, this says you have an hour. Well, this, this was given back in the good old days when we were actually sitting in a real classroom. But obviously you do have a bit longer than that. Um, in an online situation. So um, as we mentioned before in the final exam review, treat this response like a body paragraph with a topic sentence. So no hook, right? No broad statements leading into a thesis, a no separate introduction, but in that very first sentence, you are going to name the author and the title. If you don't do that, points are deducted. And you're going to regurgitate the prompt question in that first sentence just like a statement. You develop your paragraph with details, with analysis. You have to quote at least once from the short story according to these instructions and give a parenthetical or in-text citation in MLA formatting. So in parentheses, the author's last name and the page number, right? You may quote other words and phrases from the excerpt, but most of the words should be your own. A well-developed body paragraph should contain about 10 to 12 substantial sentences or around 250 words. This says upon completion, turn in your copy with your completed paragraph, but obviously you'll be submitting it online. So the title of this uh, little short story is Regret, and it's written by Kate Chapin. Uh, Madame Arley possessed a good, strong figure, ruddy cheeks, hair that was changing from brown to gray, and a determined eye. She wore a man's hat about the farm and an old blue army overcoat when it was cold and sometimes top boots. Mademoiselle Arley had never thought of marrying. She had never been in love. At the age of 20, she had received a proposal which she had promptly declined, and at the age of 50, she had not yet lived to regret it. So she was quite alone in the world, except for her dog Ponto and the Negroes who lived in her cabins and worked her crops and the fowls, a few cows, a couple of mules, her gun with which she shot chicken hawks and her religion. One morning, Mademoiselle Arley stood upon her gallery contemplating with arms akimbo, a small band of very small children who to all intents and purposes might have fallen from the clouds. So unexpected and bewildering was their coming and so unwelcome. They were the children of her nearest neighbor, Odile, who was not such a near neighbor after all. The young woman had appeared but five minutes before, accompanied by these four children. In her arms, she carried little Italy. She dragged Hinomi by an unwilling hand, while Marceline and Marcelette followed with irresolute steps. Her face was red and disfigured from tears and excitement. She had been summoned to a neighboring parish by the dangerous illness of her mother, her husband was away in Texas. It seemed to her a million miles away, and Valcine was waiting with a mule cart to drive her to the station. It's no question, Mademoiselle Arley, you just got to keep those youngsters from me till I come back. Do you say I wouldn't bother you with them if I had any other way to, to do? Make them mine, you, Mademoiselle Arley. Don't spare them. Me, there, I'm half crazy between the children and Leon not home, and maybe not even up to find Bone Man alive encore a harrowing possibility which drove Odile to take a final hasty and compulsive leave her of her disconsolate family. 
She left them crowded into the narrow strip of shade on the porch of the long, low house. The white sunlight was beating in on the white old boards. Some chickens were scratching in the grass at the foot of the steps, and one had boldly mounted and was stepping heavily, solemnly, and aimlessly across the gallery. There was a pleasant odor of pinks in the air, and the sound of Negro's laughter was coming across the flowering cotton field. Mademoiselle Aurelie stood contemplating the children. She looked with a critical eye upon Marceline, who had been left staggering beneath the weight of chubby Elodie. She surveyed with the same calculating air Marcelette, mingling her silent tears with the audible grief and rebellion of Tinami. During those few contemplating moments, she was collecting herself, determining upon a line of action which should be identical with the line of duty. She began by feeding them. If Mademoiselle Aurelie's responsibilities might have begun and ended there, they could easily have been dismissed, for her larder was amply provided against an emergency of this nature. But little children are not little pigs. They require and demand attentions which were wholly unexpected by Mademoiselle Aurelie and which she was ill prepared to give. She was indeed very inept in her management of Aurelie's children during the first few days. How could she know that Marcelette always wept when spoken to in a loud and commanding tone of voice? It was a peculiarity of Marcelette's. She became acquainted with Tenomi's passion for flowers only when she had plucked all the choicest gardenias and pinks for the apparent purpose of critically studying their botanical construction. Tain't enough to tell him, Mademoiselle Arlie, Marceline instructed her. You got to tie him in a chair. It what woman do all the time when he's bad. She tie him in a chair. The chair in which Mademoiselle Arlie tied Tinomi was roomy and comfortable, and he seized the opportunity to take a nap in it, the afternoon being warm. At night, when she ordered them one and all to bed, as she would have shooed the chickens into the hen house, they stayed uncomprehendingly before her. What about the little white nightgowns that had to be taken from the pillow slip in which they were brought over and shaken by some strong hand till they snapped like ox whips? What about the tub of water which had to be brought in and set in the middle of the floor in which the little tired, dusty, sun-brown feet had every one to be washed sweet and clean? And it made Marceline and Marcelette laugh merrily, the idea that Mademoiselle Arlie should for a moment have believed that Tinomi could fall asleep without being told the story of, and forgive me, I don't know French, so I won't try to pronounce these stories, or both, or that Italy could fall asleep at all without being rocked and sung to. I tell you, Aunt Ruby, Mademoiselle Aurelie informed her cook in confidence, me, I'd rather manage a dozen plantation than four children. It's Teresma, bon say, don't talk to me about children. Tan inspected such as you would know everything about him, Mademoiselle Arlie. I see that plainly yesterday when I spy that little child playing with your basket of keys. You don't know that make children grow up hard-headed to play with keys? Just like it make them teeth hard to look in a looking glass. Them's the things you've got to know in raising and management of children. Mademoiselle Aurelie certainly did not pretend or aspire to such subtle and far-reaching -reach knowledge on the subject as Aunt Ruby possessed who had raised five and buried six in her day. She was glad enough to learn a few little mother tricks to serve the moment's need. Tinomi's sticky fingers compelled her to unearth white aprons that she had not worn for years, and she had to accustom herself to his moist kisses, the expressions of an affectionate and exuberant nature. She got down her sewing basket, which she seldom used, from the top shelf of the armoire, and placed it within the ready and easy reach which torn slips and buttonless waist demanded. It took her some days to become accustomed to the laughing, the crying, the chattering that echoed through the house and around it all day long. And it was not the first or the second night that she could sleep comfortably with little Italy's hot, plump body pressed close against her and the little one's warm breath beating her cheek like the fanning of a bird's wing. But at the end of two weeks, Mademoiselle Arley had grown quite used to these things, and she no longer complained. It was also at the end of two weeks that Mademoiselle Arley, one evening, looking away toward the crib where the cattle were being fed, saw Valcine's blue cart turning the bend of the road. Odalie sat beside the mulatto, upright and alert. As they drew near, the young woman's beaming face indicated that her homecoming was a happy one. But this coming, unannounced and unexpected, threw Mademoiselle Arley into a flutter that was almost agitation. The children had to be gathered. Where was Tinomi? 
yonder in the shed, putting an edge on his knife in the grindstone, and Marceline and Marcelette cutting and fashioning doll rags in the corner of the gallery. As for Edelie, she was safe enough in Mademoiselle Aurelie's arms, and she had screamed with delight at the sight of the familiar blue cart, which was bringing her mother back to her. The excitement was all over, and they were gone. How still it was when they were gone. Mademoiselle Aurelie stood upon the gallery, looking and listening. She could no longer see the cart. The red sunset and the blue-gray twilight had together flung a purple mist across the fields and road had hid it from her view. She could no longer hear the wheezing and creaking of its wheels, but she could still faintly hear the shrill, glad voices of the children. She turned into the house. There was much work awaiting her, for the children had left a sad disorder behind them, but she did not at once set about the task of writing it. Mademoiselle Aurelie seated herself beside the table. She gave one slow glance through the room into which the evening shadows were creeping and deepening around her solitary figure. She let her head fall down upon her bended arm and began to cry. Oh, but she cried, not softly as women often do. She cried like a man with sobs that seemed to tear her very soul. She did not notice Ponto licking her hand. So, if your prompt question is to discuss two of Mademoiselle Arlie's character traits, think of her as being a real living human being. How would you describe her? What kind of person do we know she is from this text? Well, we might be able to say, for one, that she's been very independent. She's lived her whole life without a man without a husband, without, without children, right? She's been a solitary person living all alone, except for her servants. And remember, this story would have been set in the antebellum times before the Civil War, when slavery was happening, uh, as most of Kate Chopin's stories were. And so it was highly unusual for a woman not to be married and not to have children in this time. Yet she chose that. So in, in a sense, she was very independent and sort of felt that she didn't really need anyone around. And if you look back at the beginning of the text, you know, you'll find um, textual evidence to support that. She was wearing a man's hat. She's, she wore an old blue army coat overcoat. Uh, she wore boots, so she didn't dress like a typical woman. She wasn't the typical nurturing female of her time, right? She had never been in love. She never thought of marrying. But then what happens? She changes. And so when she's asked to take care of these children, at first she doesn't know what to do. She has no clue. Uh, she, she doesn't know a thing about what to expect. But then as the days wear on, she comes to really love the children and she comes to have these maternal feelings for them, right? And she comes to be a nurturing person. So she goes through that evolution, that process. And at the end of the text, for the first time, rather than being independent, she's lonely, isn't she? And we find the textual evidence of that at the very end. So there may be other uh, characteristics of hers that you pick up on, but those are certainly two, independent in the beginning, um, nurturing and compassionate and more the traditional female at the end. Now at the very end of this uh, text here, you'll see Kate Chopin wrote Regret, September 17th, 1894. It was first published in Century in May 1895. It was reprinted in a second volume of her short stories um, in 1897. So you could use, if you were going to create a works cited page, either the Century one or the A Night in Acadie one. Um, and you're going to have, again, at the top of the page, works cited, centered, and then you're going to have Chopin, comma, Kate, period, right? You're going to look at your little Siegel handbook to remember how to do this. And then the next thing you're gonna have is the title of the short story itself in quotation marks, regret. And then you're going to have the publication information. So you want to look at your little Siegel handbook 
how to cite um, you know, a short story that appeared in a book. Uh, and you can also look at the MLA information on our Brightspace course page to understand that as well. So I hope that this practice run will be helpful to you. I suggest that on your own you attempt to write a paragraph, to incorporate a quote or two, to back up your claim of what kind of person uh, Mademoiselle Aurélie is in this piece, and just to try your hand at it in order to have a feel for what the real final exam might be like, and I wish you the best of luck.